Hi there, um, uh, and welcome to this uh, session on uh, where to uh, store your stuff with uh, Google Cloud Platform. Uh, my name is uh, David uh, Nettleton. Um, I'm a product manager uh, here at uh, Google Cloud. I've been here for uh, about four years now and uh, been working on storage uh, throughout that time. Um, and what I'd like to do today um, is cover two main topics, really. So uh, first of all, uh, just maybe stand back a little bit um, and go through a history of how storage has evolved, uh, how databases have evolved, um, and then walk through from there um, some of the options that are available uh, in Google Cloud uh, for storing your data. Um, before I get to that, though, quick uh, safe harbor um, uh, statement, just to remind folks that um, some of the uh, announcements that I might talk about in here uh, are forward-looking um, uh, and uh, bear that in mind uh, from a safe harbor's perspective. So first of all, let me start with um, a history of uh, storage. Um, and, you know, if I go back, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, the way that storage first came about was really was storage physically attached to the computer, right? So uh, on the left-hand side here, um, there's this notion of sort of direct attached storage. Storage is physically attached to the computer that you're using. The storage is really there only to be used for the local machine and as the local data. And it's all very physically connected, often into a single piece of hardware with a monitor that somebody would then sit at. And we're going back a long way uh, for this, but this is classic direct attached storage. Also, uh, you know, the, a common PC would also look like this as well. Um, but then uh, as, uh, um, as people wanted to think about sharing their data more, um, they started to think about what does data and storage look like uh, over a network. Um, and this evolved in a number of different ways. So uh, one way in which this involved, evolved is to take, um, take the storage, uh, move just the storage over a network, um, leave a file, the file system local to the machine or the computer on which you're using, um, and have block storage uh, be remote over the network. Block storage was the preferred uh, model here uh, uh, because it would give uh, good remote performance. The file system would be local on the computer. It would use large block sizes, 8K, 8K 16K block sizes, or even larger, 64K, to communicate remotely over the network, sending large I.O. requests to bring data back and forward, and it would cache what it would need uh, locally. Um, and this really was the area of sort of storage area networks where um, uh, uh, companies could start to consolidate storage from individual machines, start to consolidate it into a central pool of storage, and manage high-performance block storage uh, uh, um, centrally and deliver it to the applications that need it uh, over the network. Um, so that was pretty good for sort of some of the high-performance use cases uh, uh, where you need the local performance on the, um, uh, on the machine. But what it didn't work so well is, is if you wanted to share files between different um, uh, users in an organization. And for that, the classic file share or the network attached storage um, was the uh, storage option that evolved for that. So it's file storage, file sharing over a network. Here, the, the file system um, is remote. Um, it's on a, uh, across the network from the compute uh, or the application that's using it. And the file system uh, is available and to all users to be able to connect to it, use it, and share it. That's great from a sharing perspective. One of the challenges with that, though, is as, as customers start to, as users in an organization, start to share and use many files, then you know lots of complexities start to arise in terms of uh, who can access what file, who's allowed to read it, who can write it, um, what are the permissions around that, um, and then managing uh, folders and hierarchies and scaling the metadata storage means that building large-scale uh, uh, scalable, high-performance file systems um, is a really uh, big, hard, challenging uh, problem. Uh, but super powerful in that it's very easy to then share applications, share uh, file data between many different applications. Um, and then, um, so that, that was really the, uh, the stor how storage evolved for very many years. Um, and then a, a final class of storage has emerged more recently uh, and actually probably popularized in the cloud uh, uh, First, uh, first and foremost, which was object storage. So here the goal is uh, to be able to store really large amounts um, of unstructured data. So think videos or uh, pictures, images, um, 
start it really cheaply and at really, really large scale. Um, um, as I said, that's something that really sort of came to fruition in the public cloud first, where customers would look for a cheap, easy way to store uh, flexibly large amounts of data and then access it uh, often occasionally um, uh, to get access to that. And you know, th this model made some very big trade-offs, right? It, um, uh, it had a very simple API. There wasn't a lot of sharing between users of the data. It's often append only. Um, and it made, made trade-offs to be able to support that storing, lar storing large amounts of data uh, remotely and being able to um, access it in a very simple uh, API. And a new API, which was the object API, was brought into uh, was brought about in order to do that. So if I if I map these sort of different classes or types of storage now to what is available in the cloud, you know the the evolution of the classic um, uh, storage being tightly coupled to the application and the file system and compute um, is available. So this is classic block storage is available in two forms in Google Cloud Platform. First of all, we have persistent disk in a, a standard and SSD format, um, which lets you uh, remotely mount um, a block storage device or a disk, uh, to your VM in a Google Cloud Platform. Um, that disk is uh, durable, uh, able to withstand restarts of the uh, VM, um, and uh, and uh, high performance. Um, in addition, we have um, a product called Local SSD, which is ephemeral storage, uh, is attached very much directly to the actual physical compute instance that is running. So you can get much, much higher performance from it, but it's, uh, but it's ephemeral, all right? So those are the two uh, block storage solutions that we have available in Google Cloud today. For net network attached storage or a, a file share where I want to uh, store, um, have a file share which shared in a department or across my enterprise, um, from Google Cloud, we have Google Cloud uh, File Store as our first party product. And then we also work closely with um, very, uh, very well with partners such as NetApp, Dell EMC, um, uh, in particular Isilon, their Isilon product, and uh, DDN. Um, and these are you know, uh, enterprise uh, vendors who've been working in, this, in the area of uh, file storage for very many years now. Um, and uh, many customers have been working with them. Um, and we want to make sure we can help carry those customers forward uh, as they look to use those products in the cloud. Um, and then for object storage in Google Cloud, the product we have there is called uh, Cloud Storage, and that's our object storage product, which lets you store uh, data at really large scale. I'll go through the in detail uh, uh, some more on the uh, Google Cloud products that we have available uh, later in the presentation. Um, so let me also talk about you know other other places in Google Cloud that you might or products in Google Cloud that you might use to store data. Um, let's talk about databases, um, and so. At a high level, you know, for many years, the world of databases, um, there was sort of a very traditional model that lasted for many years. So, so the late 60s, 70s, the classic relational database where you would store uh, a, a record in a, in a table, a row would be stored in a table, and you can join it together with other rows and other tables, really introduced a very powerful uh, model uh, for uh, managing, storing, and reasoning um, about uh, about data, and the traditional relational database management market grew to be, you know, a very very large um, uh, business with IBM and Oracle leading the way, um, and grew into a very large traditional uh, on-premises uh, industry. Um, then, um, and you know, the benefit of this was that you could do really fast reasoning over small amounts of data and store it pretty quickly. If you wanted to run large queries for analytics, do reporting um, or run a dashboard, it was normally, it was pretty bad practice to be to run those queries against the same system that's running your, you know, your, your banking application. Um, so quite often data would be uh, moved off of the database system into a data warehouse uh, via a process known as ETL, uh, ext extract, transform, load. Um, and uh, data would be copied over into um, a data warehouse. It would be rearranged in a particular way to make it really easy to do large-scale analytics and reporting. Um, and, that, and that combination of database and data warehouse really has stood the test of time for, um, for many years, and, and it, it still remains the, the, the bastion of many sort of enterprise um, organizations is uh, data storage and analytics um, uh, processes. Um, and so, really, that 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 ecosystem existed for a very long time, and then, uh, uh, and then over, uh, you know, towards the start of the, you know, through that the two thousands, there was a whole 
there's a number of different um, uh, trends that started to affect uh, how well that ecosystem could scale. So first and foremost was the emergence of just really large amounts of unstructured data with more devices connected, with the emergence of the internet, um, uh, with different types of data being generated. The traditional relational database management system just simply could not cope with that amount of storage um, anymore and the amount of analytics that needed to run over it. So several types of kind of more specialized systems started to emerge. Probably the most one of the most famous of those is the is Hadoop, which is a you know, large scale analytics platform for unstructured data that lets you gather large amounts of data really cheaply, run large amounts of batch processing over it, um, and then and uh, do anal uh, do analysis uh, on that. Um, and that, and that really, you know, really changed the dynamic of how people thought about doing analytics. And there was a big debate, you know, should I get rid of my warehouse and put everything in a data lake or everything should go in the data lake or everything goes in my data warehouse. And in reality, both of these systems are perfectly good uh, working side by side. And often customers will store data in a data lake for their initial capture and then load it eventually into a, into a warehouse. Uh, but um, Hadoop, Hadoop came along as a, a, a really interesting uh, trend um, and set of capabilities to help customers more easily get data value out of their unstructured data. Um, within the more semi-structured, structured world, two other things also happened as well. So customers would also look for, um, hey, I've got a really large amount of uh, sparse data, so key values, I want to do lookups, I'm gathering uh, records of data, which is semi-structured, and I've got a really large amount of it coming out of my IoT system, for example. It's it's semi like cell cell tower data is pretty well structured. You know, there's 15, 16 different types of data maybe in a in a record, but that's evolving over time. Um, there's really large amounts of uh, sparse uh, uh, key value uh, lookup data, um, and that again is not something that's particularly well suited for a traditional database system. Um, because of the scale that it wants to operate at and the cost um, trade-offs um, uh, taken in a slightly different direction. And then in addition, you know, as uh, um, uh, we, we also saw the trend to more uh, semi-structured data storage, things like being able to store JSON documents and do reasoning uh, over those um, as people started to capture data in uh, JSON formats. And so they, they led to, you know, another two types of databases, which are key value databases and then hierarchical databases as two other kind of classic NoSQL no um, uh, databases. So this is the category of databases that, uh, you know, they, they don't have often the, the same deep trans uh, uh, traditional um, uh, semantics of the uh, ACID properties of, uh, of uh, traditional relational database management systems. And they, they're willing to make trade-offs um, in terms of their scale uh, and other factors uh, in order to better support reasoning over different forms of data. Um, and then finally, um, and most recently, we're also now seeing a class of databases that are really large scale, scale out um, relational database management systems. So the traditional relational database management system is a scale up system. So if you'll put your database on, um, uh, on a server, you'll attach a load of storage to it, um, and if you want to store more records uh, or you want to do more compute, you've got to add more processors to that same machine or you've got to add more disks uh, to that array, right? Um, and so it was a classic scale-up system. Um, and that runs into some challenges that, you know, you, you, customers are buying bigger and bigger systems to operate at larger and larger scale. Um, and uh, that becomes very expensive. Um, and uh, not always very flexible then in terms of where you can deploy that. You know, you can only deploy it in a single location. Um, so now, re more recently, there's a, there's a class of database systems um, uh, which let you now store records transactionally uh, at global scale um, and, um, and manage uh, really large scale uh, tr transactional uh, database systems. I mean, if I go through the... Uh, Google Cloud products that are available um, across this portfolio. So first of all, for traditional database, we have the Cloud SQL um, a set of products for MySQL, Postgres, and SQL Server that let you run and manage a, a database. BigQuery is our data warehouse our product for a data lake. Uh, Google Cloud uh, Data Proc and Cloud Storage give you um, a data proc for uh, managing compute, and, and uh, Cloud Storage is your data lake. Um, and then uh, Bigtable provides uh, key value storage files, Firestore uh, for hierarchical data, and then Cloud Spanner 
um, is our database for really large scale uh, um, global um, transactional uh, databases. So with that overview in mind, um, I just thought I'd have uh, add a slide here that should gives you a rough mapping of the different types of storage options that are available to you, depending on uh, what it is that you are looking to do uh, with Google Cloud. Um, now, let me maybe just dive into the sort of the ones that are on the right side there, the the, uh, the storage products. So I'll I'll leave the database uh, overviews to uh, to other sessions, and I'm just going to now concentrate and go through some of the storage options that are available on uh, GCP. So first of all, Google Cloud Storage. So this is our large scale um, object storage product. Customers are normally using this for three uh, different use cases. Um, so content storage and delivery. So if you want to store large amounts of media, video, images, and serve them um, uh, 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 out to customers um, or store them for later analysis, um, Google Cloud Storage is a, is a really great product for that. Customers like Spotify use this for storing and serving media content, for example. Uh, backup archival DR. So a very common use case where um, you have a, a set of data on premises that you're looking to protect. You want to store it remotely um, on a different media uh, to protect yourself against a disaster, either a physical disaster or a, you know, someone accidentally deleting some data on premises, and you want to be able to recover it via a, a backup process. Um, so Google Cloud Storage is integrated with uh, very many backup and DR products from our partners um, and is available um, uh, uh, to use for a backup archival uh, and uh, DR. Um, and then, uh, and then the final use case is analytics, uh, big data, and ML. So I talked about the, the use case where customers are wanting to store really large amounts of unstructured data for processing, and they want somewhere to store that cheaply. And the cloud is a great place to do that. They can use something like Google Cloud Storage to store the data uh, super cheaply. And then because compute and storage is separate from each other, customers can um, uh, store their data. And when they want to run a Hadoop cluster over it, they can just spin that cluster up, run it for the amount of time that's needed, and then shut it down. And this is a huge value uh, over um, uh, the alternative on-premises, which is often trying to size compute and storage together in a single um, piece of uh, equipment, uh, often having to deal with planning for peak capacity um, and, and then trying to run it uh, to make sure that um, if in quiet times that you know, you're not wasting capacity. Um, so it takes away a lot of the, 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 the challenges with trying to optimize the uh, your TCO for a, a cluster on premises. So with the cloud, you can separate compute from storage, use only what you need on storage, use only what, what you need for compute and run those independently. Um, and the, the product we have, Google Cloud Storage, super powerful for those use cases. Um, a couple of things I'll highlight there with this is we have a number of different tiers from standard near line, cold line, all the way down to archival. Um, and these just give you different ways to pay for how you uh, store your data. Something that's really interesting about the product and very differentiated is that across all of those uh, different tiers, it's the same API and the same access speeds to the data. So you don't need to change anything in your application um, to be able to take advantage of tiering data down to cheaper and cheaper uh, storage classes um, if you don't need to, if your data doesn't need to be accessed. But if all of a sudden that kitten movie that was super popular five years ago suddenly picks up again, well, it's right there and immediately available uh, for access, even if it might be in an archive tier. There's no staging it back from a, a different storage product that has to bring it back to take a few hours to stage it back to um, your main uh, storage tiers. Uh, so that's, so that's a, a couple of uh, benefits uh, for uh, storage in general. And then a few other things specific to use cases. So um, we have um, uh, for common storage and delivery, uh, we globally edge cache data and accelerate uploads. So data coming in from Europe and stored in the US, we'll bring it onto the Google Cloud network as soon as possible and carry it on the network for as long as possible until we serve it. Um, with big data and analytics for Hadoop, um, all of the different readers in GCS will see uh, the same uh, data. So um, one, one, uh, one of the great features of Google Cloud Storage is that it actually uses Spanner, which I, I talked about as that transactionally consistent database to store all of our metadata. So when uh, somebody reads or when somebody writes data, all, everybody else can see the same data, which is a big benefit for, uh, for Google's product here. Um, that's actually pretty hard to do and something that's uh, super powerful. 
Um, and then as I talked about a, a little bit earlier, for backup DR archival, across all our storage classes, you get instant access to the data, no need to stage access to the recovery and deal with uh, um, uh, uh, complicated workflows as to how you're gonna get access to your data. And then it, um, we have uh, a couple of products in the multi-regional category, dual regional uh, and multi-regional, um, which will um, store your data uh, in such a way that if a region goes down, uh, then you can have it um, uh, immediately uh, be able to read data, uh, continue to read data um, uh, from uh, another copy of the data in another region. So um, providing RTO, so recovery time objective of zero on failure. So if a region goes down, the multi-region, the dual region is still available uh, for reads um, and you can, your application can continue serving as though uh, nothing has happened. Um, persistent disk. So persistent disk is our block storage product. So here, um, you're really looking to um, attach um, uh, a disk uh, to uh, a VM um, and uh, run a whole range of, tradi of applications, traditional sort of three-tier applications or high-end database applications um, uh, or even uh, Hadoop and big data applications sometime run on this for the performance. Um, and with persistent disk, we have uh, today, we have two tiers, which is a standard tier and a high performance tier. Um, and over the last year, um, We've steadily improved the performance of those. Um, for example, for a, a persistent disk um, SSD, we've steadily improved the IOPS that's available for those tiers from 60K to 100,000 IOPS, all just as part of the product uh, that was available. Um, today, um, we're, uh, we'll be, you know, we're announcing um, some new uh, tiers uh, for SSD. So feedback we heard from customers was that while they really enjoyed the sort of the easy to use performance, there's a couple of, uh, uh, trade-offs that they, they, they found hard to make with a product that we had. So what we want to do is introduce a new tier that is um, has fewer, has lower performance and is uh, better priced. Um, that, that's our new balance tier that will be available at uh, 10 cents a gig versus SSD's current 17 cents a gig. And then we're also going to introduce an extreme tier for customers, uh, typically high-end database customers that want the very highest uh, performance. Um, starting with you know, 120,000 IOPS and uh, eventually going up from there. And then across all of these products, some things that are really powerful about uh, Persistent Disk is that it's just really easy, really easy to use. Um, the, um, the disks can be dynamically resized. They can be easily moved around between VMs. You don't need to stripe your disks or pre-warm the disks uh, to get the maximum performance. It's all there ready and available on demand. One big thing we focus on very hard in um, uh, storage at Google Cloud is just making our products really, really easy to use for customers so that, that you can focus on uh, building the applications and adding value to your, uh, uh, to your businesses. Um, then uh, some other uh, capabilities that we have for high availability backup and DR. Um, so uh, for high availability, um, you can create a regional disk, uh, which creates a disk between two different zones and actively uh, create active active replication, so synchronous replication between those two disks, which is super important if you want to be able to build an application that can survive a, a zone failure uh, and recover quickly on the other side, typically for something like a database. Um, and then we also have controls for being able to take snapshots to protect your data. So you can take a disk, snapshot it, the data is stored in a different medium, you can store that snapshot in a different region, you can schedule snapshots. So, uh, works well with traditional uh, backup and recovery workflows. Um, and then file store. So, uh, so as I talked about file store, this is for customers who are looking for a traditional uh, file share available as a managed service. Um, classic use cases are, you know, I, have a, I, have a, I want to share files in a, um, across my organization. Uh, I might be sharing them for video and image and ed editing. I might be storing web content, home directories. Um, et cetera, or I might be doing large scale um, uh, rendering, video and image editing. And so with Filestore, we offer fully managed network attached storage available in two different tiers, um, uh, HDD and SSD tiers. Um, uh, again, uh, goal here is to give you know, really easy to use, um, easy to understand price performance with really great um, performance. Very e easy to use with both Google Cloud Engine uh, for VMs and Google K Kubernetes uh, engine for Kubernetes. Um, another um, uh, announcement that we're very excited about, um, uh, less than a year ago, we acquired a company called um, Elastifile, um, which had a, a really powerful set of uh, scale out uh, file store, um, uh, had a very powerful scale out file store file product. Um, and 
Um, we are really excited to have that now uh, launching as a new tier of uh, file store uh, called the high scale tier. And this will let customers scale to hundreds of terabytes, tens of gigabytes of throughput, hundreds of thousands uh, of IOPS, and really help customers with some of those large scale um, web and um, high throughput um, media rendering uh, batch workloads. So very excited about that. Um, and then uh, the final area I want to cover so um, is around transfer. So um, having all of this, uh, these capabilities in the cloud is great, but how am I going to get my data there? Uh, so our customers come to us with many challenges here. Sometimes they're shutting down data centers and they want to move to the cloud. Sometimes they want to do POCs. Sometimes they're capturing large amounts of data for analytics uh, workloads, IoT workloads, and they want to bring that data to the cloud. We have two different products available. Uh, for customers here, transfer appliance. So this is a physical appliance that you can order from Google. We will ship it to you. You can rack it in your data center, wire it up, and just load it up uh, directly um, with data. And you can move uh, up to a petabyte of data on this single appliance um, without having to um, uh, send any data over the network. So this is physical transfer of data. Um, uh, and then secondly, we also have a transfer service, which is a software solution, which will move data over the network um, you can now uh, you can uh, move it between clouds uh, within Google Cloud, um, and then uh, earlier this year we announced that you could move uh, data from on-premises to cloud by transfer services on-premises. So here you download an agent. Um, it can help manage the amount of bandwidth and network that you want to make available to the transfer, and then manage long-running transfers uh, of data um, to the cloud. So again, our goal, goal here is to really help customers make it as easy as possible to bring your data to GCP. Uh, finally, I really want to highlight uh, our, our partners. Um, so Google Cloud has a number of amazing uh, first party products, um, but um, we also have a really great set of partners who we work with on a number of use cases. We have a lot of customers who are familiar with using these products and we want to make sure they have a great experience uh, in GCP. And also these partners have products that you know do things that we just simply don't do today. And we want to make sure that Customers can still have access to those capabilities in Google Cloud, um, even if we don't have them as first party products. So for File, we've done a lot of work with NetApp, Dell EMC um, to provide uh, integrated experiences in Google Cloud, and then also with uh, DDN to have a marketplace experience for um, some high-end uh, Lustre workloads. Um, and then for backup and disaster recovery, so very, very many um, uh, companies, again, use and are familiar with all, a range of different um, uh, partners here. And so we've worked a lot with uh, all those partners to make sure that we've integrated uh, closely with them to make sure they have a great experience with uh, GCP. And with that, um, I would like to thank you for listening today and um, say goodbye. Thank you.